And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil, knowing that the world is imperfect. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband and he ate. Then both of their eyes were opened and they both knew they were naked and imperfect. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aproned. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore God sent, forth, sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. He drove out the man and the woman at the east gate of Eden. He placed a cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned every which way to guard the way to the tree of life. And of course, that's from Genesis, Hebrew scripture, what Christians call the Old Testament. The interesting thing here is that if you read the creation account in the book of Genesis, there's no indication that God created a perfect world. The phrase, it was good, is not that it was, doesn't say it's perfect. By making this, the decision to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and carrying this out, Adam and Eve discovered that the world wasn't perfect. And for the first time, they realized they were naked. Interesting to note that God says that because of this, man has become like us. Apparently, God knows what imperfection is. Built into the fabric of creation is imperfection. Following the instant of creation, which our science tells us was some 13 and a half billion years ago, the universe in that instant of creation was comprised of both matter and antimatter. Matter has positive charge and antimatter has negative charge. When matter and antimatter come together, they annihilate each other and give off vast amounts of energy. Had the amount of matter and antimatter been uniform, the early universe would have, been complete, would have completely destroyed itself. But it wasn't uniform, it wasn't perfect. There was more positively charged particles than negatively charged particles, so the universe was able to survive. And it eventually created the matter that would become stars and planets and human beings and all of us. The very fact that evolution is an inevitable force in the unfolding development of the universe and life itself is clear evidence that imperfection is embedded into the forces of the universe. The universe strives for perfection and continually changes and adapts and tries to become perfect. It's an ongoing and never-ending process. Human beings know that the world is not a perfect place, yet we always seem to endeavor to make it so. And we often feel disempowered when we are subject to the world's imperfection. Imperfection causes us to question the world around us and to fathom why evil and sadness and despair exist at all. The fact that we have emotions is actually the result of the imperfections of the universe. If we were perfect, we would be happy all the time. Or maybe we would have no feelings at all because we had no understanding of sadness and pain. In a perfect world, bad things would not happen to good people. Sickness and disease and death would not exist. Evil would not exist and nothing but goodness would pervade all of reality. It's actually the imperfections of the universe that enable all of these things to occur. Knowing that imperfection is an ever-present and pervading reality of the universe 
Many religions of the world, and certainly those in the West, have created an eventual paradise, a heaven, where good human beings will go when they die. Free from the shackles of an imperfect world, humans will live forever in a blissful paradise, which will be perfect, a place of total goodness where evil and the forces of the imperfect won't exist. If we look at Eastern religions, particularly Buddhism and Hinduism, the philosophy of, a, of an eventual perfect existence is similar in some sense to the Western heaven, particularly in certain forms of Buddhism. Both Hinduism and, and Buddhism recognize that the world is not a perfect place and both believe that it's really we humans that create the imperfections through our actions and our inactions. Both believe in the Four Noble Truths. Life is filled with suffering. Suffering is a real result of desire. Suffering can be eliminated by ceasing to desire, and ceasing to desire can be realized by following the Eightfold Path, which includes lots of things like right intention, right speech, right actions, right livelihood, right mindfulness, right concentration, etc. The ultimate goal of both the Hindu and Buddhist is to achieve nirvana, which is defined as a kind of snuffing out. It isn't non-existence. People make that mistake. It's rather a total separation from the imperfect world, a realization that the universe is but an illusion, a realization that all is one, and in hin Hinduism, a realization that everything, including us, is nothing but a different manifestation of God, which Hindus call Brahma. Many years ago, I had the pleasure to meet the Associate Unitarian Universalist minister at, at the Brewster UU Church, Reverend G. Peter Fleck. Many of you knew him. He wrote a book called The Blessings of Imperfection, hence the name of this sermon. I named it after his book. The room downstairs is named after him. Peter Fleck and his wife Ruth were extraordinary people. They were Dutch and they were Jewish. They escaped the Nazi peril in the 1930s and came to America. They settled in New Jersey and Peter became a successful banker. They retired to Cape Cod many years, along, uh, many years later and along the way, uh, Peter completed seminary. One of the marvelous realities of imperfection, Reverend, P Reverend Peter often said, was that imperfection creates or imperfection produces creativity and messiness all at the same time. And the messiness to which Reverend Fleck was referring is the inability of many humans to accept how the world works, to acknowledge that evil and sadness coexist along with goodness and joy. Sometimes it's hard for us to acknowledge this, he said. And then, then Reverend Fleck told a story of his four-year-old grandson. I, I can't forget it. Seems that at age four, Benjamin told his mother about an imar imaginary farm where he was the owner. One day he was describing the farm to his mother and he explained how the vet came by and cut a little piece off the hoof of the cow and now she had a calf. Well, Benjamin's mother decide, decided this was probably a good opportunity to explain the realities of life and so she proceeded to explain how reproduction really happened. So she embarked on a long story of how a sperm and an egg are joined in the womb and create an embryo and how a calf is eventually born between the cow's legs. You see, Benjamin, this is how it really happens. Whereupon Benjamin looked her straight in the eye and he said, not on my farm it does. <laughs> as, as Reverend Fleck noted at his age, his grandson, like many people at any age, are not just able to accept that the world is imperfect, that creativity is joined with messiness, that life is ambiguous. Reverend Fleck gave another example. It is said, he explained, that when the souls of the dead enter heaven, the angels play the music of Bach, but among themselves they play Mozart. 
Why? Because the young Mozart was portrayed in the movie quite, Amadeus, quite correctly, that he was a vulgar little man who used four-letter words and behaved accordingly. So again, we're confronted with imperfection, a combination of incredible creativity combined with vulgarity and impropriety. Western religions and societies have always struggled to understand the imperfections that are inherent in the world. Why do bad things happen to good people? How could a loving God enable such sadness and misery to pervade the world? Why do people suffer so much as we see today taking place in Gaza and in a host of other places? Many forms of fundamentalist Christianity offer an explanation. By choosing to disobey God and eat the, of the tree of knowledge and life, as described in the book of Genesis, some conservative Christian faith suggests that Adam and Eve enabled evil and perfection to enter the world, and thus making the world an evil place controlled by the devil. In this view, the world is but the workshop of the devil, and the devil spends his time influencing and controlling human beings. As they say in conservative churches, in Adam's fall, we sin all. Actually, this is the origin of original sin and why baptism occurs in Christian churches, because it's supposed to wash away that original sin created by Adam and Eve. The idea that the world is an evil and imperfect place, best be avoided, was reinforced in conservative Christianity in the early 20th century. Throughout the latter part of the 19th century, liberal Christianity, which at the time included Unitarians and Universalists, promoted the idea that through proactive means, humanity with its science and its technology could make the world a better place. It was through this that the social gospel movement was created and loads of charities were created in the latter part of the 19th century. The social gospel movement called for the creation of all of these institutions designed to combat pain and suffering and disease and despair. Religious conservatives were aghast and they wanted no part of it. The world was imperfect because Adam and Eve had made it so. The purpose of life was to save your soul, pay homage to God and await redemption in a perfectly heavenly place. World War I was such a destructive war which killed millions of people that the, the term fundamentalist was coined in 1917. So when you hear about fundamentalism, it's not that old. It's not back 100 years, it's 1917. To liberals, the fundamentalists said, all your science and technology and social gospel actions have only resulted in massive destruction and millions of human beings killed. And so, fundamentalists retrenched in their beliefs, and many of the most liberal Christians, which included the Unitarians and the Universalists, not together yet, shunned the idea of God, for in their view, no loving God, it was thought, would enable or such destruction and sadness and despair to happen. From this, the Unitarians and the Universalists focused on humanism, and in my words, they threw God out of the pulpit. It wasn't that either denomination was atheistic, but merely that they chose to remove God from the mainstay of consideration and thought. Yet other Christians took a different approach. While acknowledging the imperfection in the world and the existence of evil and the fact that bad things do indeed happen to good people, liberal Christians considered that maybe God has limited power over creation by design. The world was imperfect because God had made it so and God itself was continuing to evolve just as the universe was. This philosophy is called process philosophy, and it was championed by Alfred North Whitehead in the first half of the, ninth, uh, first half of the 20th century. Whitehead was a British mathematician and philosopher. In Whitehead's view, the universe was an imperfect place that is in constant evolution and change. God as the source of the universe is similarly growing and changing too. God experiences the universe as we do. When a human being is happy, so too is God. When human suffering and tragedy occur, God also suffers. 
The nature of creation is such that God cannot interfere with of the freedom and thought or action that occur in the universe. Godly interventions in creation would destroy the orderly flow of scientific law that molds and governs the cosmos. And so we're left in a bit of a quandary. We must acknowledge that the universe is indeed an imperfect place. Along with all the beauty and goodness that permeate the world, we also know and see evil and destruction and pain and suffering and we are forced to come to terms with why this is so. For those who see the workings of a god or gods in the universe, they must come to terms with why such a god or gods could allow the world to be imperfect. For those who see no god or gods as influencing the world, it's perhaps easier to understand why the world is imperfect. In either case, the reality of imperfection is apparent. Yet it is imperfection that is also the engine of growth and change and the enabler of love and joy. By our nature, we human beings want perfection and we constantly strive for it. The athlete who conditions their body and spends endless hours of practice strives for athletic perfection. The scientist who spends a lifetime exploring the workings of the universe is seeking perfect knowledge of why things work the way they do. The lover in search of a mate seeks the perfect match. And of course, imperfection is all around us. We cannot be perfect and we cannot find perfection for these are not found in the universe that we live in. There's nothing inherently wrong with seeking the perfect, but if we do not acknowledge the reality of imperfection, we can never be happy. It will be like a drowning man who can't swim there's no chance of saving himself. Accepting imperfection, and in some cases celebrating it, is an essential act of pursuing happiness. Let's start with our body just as an example. What defines a perfect body? Well, it depends upon the culture you're born and raised in. Being fat is a sign of beauty and success in some cultures, but not others. Big noses are attractive in some cultures, but not others. The size of a person, the color of their eyes, and the shape of their features. What is considered perfect varies considerably from culture to culture. So too does what is considered imperfect. Frankly, it is the imperfection in the human animal that causes us to look differently, to have different skills and abilities, and for each of us to be totally unique in all the universe. It's the imperfection that enables this variety to exist. Wouldn't a perfect race of human beings be rather boring? It almost would be like a race of robots, all identical in appearance and none striving to be better than they are because they're already perfect. Sadly, we're bombarded every day by images of what is considered perfect, even though these are always culturally driven. Not only knowing the reality of imperfection, some people, often young people, are driven to despair because they see themselves as not perfect or not perfect like others their age. We see this in images of young skinny teenage girls in particular, fed by Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all those wonderful social media um, devices. Some girls think that if they do not conform to the marketing image of a teenage girl, they are somehow lesser people. At this stage in their young life, people often do not understand the blessings of imperfection. The very act of loving another person involves the acceptance of imperfection, if not a wholesale embrace of another's imperfection. Stop and think about it. How could anyone love a perfect person? It's Though understanding another's failures and shortcomings, it's through understanding another's failures and shortcomings that we exercise love. The wife, the husband, watches their spouse's great disappointment at failing at some professional task. The husband or wife sees the frustration of their spouse when they cannot get their teenage daughter to understand their point of view. The parents who see their child fail in school. All of these things elicit love for it is in acknowledging the imperfection in, in others that we are joined to them as co-voyagers in the journey through life. Alfred North Whitehead would have said that God does exactly the same thing 
and God participates in the imperfection of the universe. From a personal standpoint, it is imperfection that enables us to grow and change as people. Were we perfect, there wouldn't be any reason to grow or change. It's through our failures and our own imperfections that we make choices that enable us to grow in mind and spirit. It is through pain and suffering and catastrophe that we can embrace love and truly make a difference in the world, changing it for the better. Today, we see countless stories of this taking place in so many suffering places in the world. In reviewing Reverend Fleck's material on the imperfection of the world, I was struck by the story of Pearl Buck, the prize-winning Pulitzer Prize-winning American author who became the first American woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature for her work describing China in the 1930s. Pearl Buck had a daughter in 1920. Sadly, this daughter had a rare brain disease that resulted in severely decreased mental capability. Unable to accept this, Pearl Buck spent years trying in vain to find a cure for her daughter. Finally, she did accept there was no, nothing that she could do for her, but she, there was a lot she could do for the children of China, born from particularly from mixed race backgrounds. Over time, she adopted nine mixed race children, and in 1949, she established Welcome House, the first international interracial adoption agency. Since its inception, Welcome House has found loving homes for more than 7,000 children. From the depths of sadness and despair over the affliction of her daughter, Pearl Buck went on to profoundly infuse love and compassion into the lives of thousands of people. And her legacy carries on. Because of the changes in the international adoption laws, Welcome House was closed in 2014. However, Pearl Buck's foundation continues to bring together cultures, different cultures and societies to try to develop understanding between themselves. The imperfection of the universe is everywhere apparent, particularly in human beings. While we can be proud of our inherent abilities and innovation, we must also acknowledge our capacity to create misery and suffering and death. The 20th century was filled with scientific achievement. We learned to conquer a large number of human diseases. We learned to eradicate a lot of hunger and human suffering around the world. So many great things. Yet at the same time, we developed technologies that killed 100 million people in the decade around World War II. And we witnessed unspeakable acts of depravity characterized by the Holocaust in Germany, in Cambodia, in Africa, and in the Balkans. It's all too easy to become cynical in studying human history. And it takes effort to retain a positive view of humanity. It really does particularly in light of such misery and suffering that afflicts all human beings. It's easy to dismiss a sacred presence in the universe, a divine spark, a force that underlies all of creation. For how and why would such a force enable such tragic suffering to be part of any universe? The answer is that perfection would not allow growth and change. It wouldn't allow creativity and genius. It wouldn't allow love and hope to overcome hatred and, yes, despair. Hatred and despair are realities, but so too are the forces of love and compassion that can overcome them. In his work, Man's Search for Meaning, the noted physician and psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor, Dr. Viktor Frankl, wrote of one of his moments in the concentration camp. I'm going to share this with you. But I got to warn you, I have a hard time getting through this, so forgive me. <clears throat> we stumbled on in the darkness over big stones and through large puddles along the one road leading from the camp. The accompanying guards <laughs> kept shouting at us and driving us with the butts of their rifles. Anyone with very sore feet supported himself on his neighbor's arm. Hardly a word was spoken. The icy wind did not encourage talk. Hiding his mouth behind his upturned collar, the man marching next to me whispered, 
If our wives could see us now, I do hope they are better off in their camps and don't know what's happening to us. A thought transfixed, it, a thought transfixed me for the first time in my life. I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers, the truth that love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. I understand, I understood how a man who has nothing left in the world still may know bliss, be it only for brief moments in the contemplation of his beloved. In a position of utter des desolation, when man cannot express himself in positive action, when his only achievement may consist in enduring his sufferings in the right way, in an honorable way, in such a position man can, through loving contemplation of the image he carries of his beloved, achieve fulfillment. For the first time in my life, I was, uh, I was able to understand the meaning of the words, the angels are lost in perpetual contemplation of in infinite glory. The universe and our world are imperfect places, but in their imperfection there is holiness and salvation. The blessings of imperfection are all around us. We, only, we need only to open our hearts and our minds to unlock the secrets that lie within, secrets that can enable our spirits to, fo to follow the bridge across forever. Peace be with you. <laughs>